welcome again. So today's lesson will be on shipwrecks and salvage. And in the previous lesson, we looked at bacterial corrosion and bacteria and how they interact with each other and the environment to produce energy. So in today's lesson, we're actually going to look at the chemistry of their me metabolism and how that interacts with steel to give us bacterial corrosion. Okay. Just as a recap, we know that some anaerobic bacteria obtain energy by reducing sulfate. Okay. We consider this quite a primitive pathway in terms of um, primitive being you know older rather than you know sort of the more modern oxygen consuming metabolic pathway. So this is quite a primitive met metabolism, and we used it. Well, organisms used it when oxygen was very low in uh, low in concentration in the atmosphere. However, what we do notice is that this reduction process significantly corrodes metal objects, particularly steels, because they're full of iron. So, the sulfate reduction process, and what does it actually do? And here's just an example of what can happen with the sulfate reduction. So, in the last lesson, I covered in with the question segment how to get this equation. And basically, it's the reduction half reaction of the process, and you're turning sulfate ions into hydrogen sulfide. And using your redox rules, uh, add water for every to balance oxygen, add hydrogen ions to balance hydrogen and all that, you can actually derive this out. And I showed you how to do that in the last lesson. Now the oxidation half reaction is obviously to do with metal or iron because we're corroding it. So you can see 4Fe solid, the iron metal, turns into the ferrous ion or Fe2 plus ion, all four of them, and eight electrons. Okay, and you can see the number of electrons consumed is the same. Okay? So it's a very simple oxidation process. It's just the oxidation of the metal. So the overall reaction is just simply just take all of the things on the left-hand side of the arrow, add them together. So there you have it, ignoring the electron. And then add all the things on the right-hand side, ignoring the electron again. And you get H2S plus 4H2O and 4 ferrous ions. So these are your, this is your overall reaction. So it's, you can derive it once you know these two. Okay. Now what happens is that those ferrous ions or Fe2 plus ions react with either OH minus ions, which may be around, or sulfide ions to form really insoluble iron compounds. Um, so iron sulfide may have a yellowish hue. Um, and FeOH can sometimes be whitish or brown, depending on what oxidation state the iron is in. Now these bacterial deposits actually clump together to form areas of localized corrosion. And as I mentioned before, we call them rusticles, the portmanteau of rust and icicle, because uh, they form like sort of longish, stalactite looking things on the steel. Okay? So the bacteria kind of clump together and corrode one area and we call that a rusticle. So they happen to be mainly composed of iron hydroxides. Remembering that iron hydroxide tends to be that brownish, rusty color that we always kind of associate with rust. And that's why um, we can see that they should mostly be made of iron hydroxides because the rusticle itself is quite brownish. Yeah. Now this bacterial activity is also responsible for the corrosion of pipes in waterlogged or low oxygenated soils in terrestrial environments. So for instance, if we were, I don't know, maybe taking oil from one place to another, and we had to put the pipeline through a swamp, uh, and we buried the pipe, we could experience a lot of corrosion because the pipe may be in a situation where there's no oxygen, because it's buried under this swamp mud or swamp soil. And what happens is, these bacteria actually live in that area and reduce sulfate to produce um, sulfide. And so you get also you know, this rusting or this corrosion occurring because it's corroding the pipe even though there's no oxygen. And it could be why you know, swamps have that characteristic swampy smell, could be contributed to sulfate reducing bacteria as well. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on sulfate reduction. We actually looked at the chemistry of sulfate reduction. Very simple, well, maybe not simple, but very doable um, chemistry. And 
with all the things that you've learned in your previous um, lessons about redox reactions, you will be able to solve, or at least derive out, the equations for sulfate reduction. Okay, so we'll move on to the question segment now. So question six, contrary to predictions, the Titanic shipwreck shows extensive corrosion. Which of the following explains this? So we could start with B, conditions at depth were different to predictions and oxygen was present in sufficient concentration for corrosion to occur. Probably not this one, um, unless we, our science is really bad, which it's not, um, then that could be true, I suppose, if our science wasn't very good, but it's probably not true. Higher life forms were present around the wreck and the seabed sediments were found to be acidic. And again, not very likely. Higher life forms need a lot of energy and oxygen is needed for energy production at, at big scale. Probably not C, and there's no oxygen at the bottom of the ocean. D, galvanic cells were set up in the steel hull with the cathode reaction being reduction of sulfate. Well, we haven't really talked about galvanic cells yet, so it's probably not D. So the answer is probably A, the growth of anaerobic bacteria. Yes, that's one reason for corrosion. And an acidic microenvironment around the wreck. So it was not only acidic, it was also the bacteria um, damaging the, the ship. Okay. So clarify the role of sulfate ions at great depths. Well, sulfate is used inside the anaerobic bacterial cell in respiration. The reaction with H plus ions and electrons is part of their cellular process. And the resulting H2S diffuses out of the bacterial cell. Okay. Now, pretty much most other organisms use oxygen instead of sulfate, but these particular ones use sulfate because it's available. Okay. So explain why there are no organisms found on the Titanic that have exoskeletal shells, like those found in shallower waters. So what I mean by that is, well, can we explain why that we don't see any organisms on the Titanic that have hard exoskeletons, like crabs or hermit crabs or something like that? Um, so those kind of shellfish, okay? At the depths of the Titanic wreck, carbon dioxide is high, okay? In concentration. However, at higher pressures, CO2 doesn't precipitate as readily, and therefore organisms that rely on precipitating CO2 for the formation of shells cannot inhabit such large depths. Okay, so remember that carbon dioxide is more soluble at high pressure. Okay, so if we're at a very high pressure, which is which is very likely at the bottom of the ocean, then CO2 doesn't precipitate very well. And so organisms that need to precipitate it out in order to get you know, their ec hard exoskeleton, well, they can't do that simply because the pressure is too much. Additionally, because of all of the sulfate-reducing bacteria, the acidity of that area is slightly higher than anywhere else. Um, so that acidity can also contribute to a lack of CO2, well, CO, yeah, CO2 precipitation. Okay? So it's a slightly higher acidity level which can ruin the, the, the carbonate process. Yeah. So many black stains were found on metal objects in the Titanic shipwreck. Explain what these black stains are and where they originated from. Okay. So this is a question that you wouldn't be able to answer just by looking at it. If you have some life experience with certain objects, then maybe you might be able to understand what's going on. But if, for instance, anyone plays um, the flute, or has used silver uh, cutlery. Um, so for those who play the flute, if you've ever had a pimple sort of here and rested your flute against it after you've put on pimple cream, then you'll notice a very big black stain on your flute because your flute is silver plated, um, or usually silver plated, not always. Um, and there's sulfur in the pimple cream. So what happens is it stains, it reacts with the silver in your flute plating and you get a black stain. In the silverware case, if you're using silver cutlery, if you've ever eaten eggs with silver cutlery, you shouldn't because you will get those black stains again because eggs have sulfur in them. That's why when eggs go bad, they smell terrible because you have hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so what's the common uh, elements here? Silver and sulfur. So sulfur tends to put black stains on some metals. And so we'll move on to the answer and we'll see how that kind of links together. So because of the high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide, copper and silver objects react with 
this chemical to form Ag2S and CUS. So like I mentioned, the silver and the sulfur come together and you get that black stain. Same with copper though as well. These products are black and can be seen in coating many of the artifacts of the Titanic. Okay? So this question was really vague, um, but if you have some experience with silver, um, particularly if you're a flute player or if you use silver cutlery, then um, you could have answered it, maybe, because we were always talking about sulfur in, the last, in this series. Okay? So after about 90 years of submersion, the Titanic shows bioconcretus rusticles involving many communities of bacteria and fungi. Describe the corrosion process of the Titanic involving anaerobic bacteria. So the Titanic sunk, as we know, at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. You know, there's a big movie about it. It's historical. It's a big thing. Where there's very little oxygen, a complete absence of light, and a temperature that's about 4 degrees, which is about the temperature when water is densest, also as a side note. Anaerobic conditions exist in such an environment because there's no oxygen. And anaerobic bacteria live at the bottom and are sulfate reducing because there's no oxygen okay? and there's lots of sulfate. Now the, the microbacterial activity has contributed significantly to the corrosion of the Titanic. And so we've seen this equation, the reduction half reaction of the reduction of sulfate. And so we saw that, um, we did that We've derived it, we've looked at it, um, so you should remember this. And the oxidation is just simply the oxidation of the iron metal to Fe2 plus ions. And those Fe2 plus ions react with H2S, oh sorry, Hs minus, or also um, S min S2 minus and OH minus to form insoluble compounds such as FeS and FeOH2. So it can bond with lots of these chemicals and become very insoluble. And then these bacterial corrosion, this bacterial corrosion process, sorry, forms reddish brown growths called rusticles, and they hang from the steel structure like stalactites. They contain a mixture, these rusticles that is, contain a mixture of oxides and hydroxides of iron, and other substances produced by bacteria such as calcium carbonate as well. So the biological activity in seawater is therefore a significant feature in the rate of corrosion of the Titanic. Okay? So the Titanic sunk, these bacteria really, really got a hold of it and started to corrode it because they need to live, and it just so happened that the iron in the steel also oxidized because of the environment that they were in. Okay? So this concludes today's lesson on sulfate reduction. We looked at the actual metabolic process of sulfate reduction, and we looked at you know, how does it relate sort of to the Titanic if we were talking about um, a Titanic as a, as a case study. Okay. So in the future, we'll talk about the acidity of these um, great depth of the bottom of the ocean, and we'll talk about how the acidity also accelerates corrosion. So look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.